In the fMRI tutorial you just completed, you learned that group level contrast maps are created through something called a mass univariate analysis. In other words, we carry out as many statistical tests as there are voxels. Given that a typical fMRI dataset contains tens of thousands of voxels, this can quickly lead to an unacceptably large number of false positives. To control for the number of false positives, therefore, and to keep them at the conventional false positive rate of 5%, we need to do something called multiple comparisons correction. In the good old days, many neuroimaging researchers used a correction method called Bonferroni correction. It's simple to understand and simple to do. Take your alpha level, or the false positive rate you're willing to live with, traditionally set at 5%, and divide it by the number of tests that you carry out. This works well enough for behavioral studies, but quickly becomes unreasonable when applied to imaging data. For example, if your group level contrast map contains 100,000 voxels and your alpha level is 0.05, an individual voxel will have to pass a significance threshold of 0.00000005 in order to be judged statistically significant. Although Bonferroni correction will ensure that your false positive rate is no higher than 5%, it's also a very conservative test. Bonferroni correction is valid only when each test is independent. To take our fMRI dataset again as an example, that would mean each voxel is completely independent of every other voxel in the brain. Knowing the value of one voxel doesn't tell you anything about any other voxel. But are the voxels completely independent? Let's take a look at a typical fMRI image. If we zoom in, notice that a given voxel is similar to its neighbors. Bright voxels tend to be surrounded by brighter voxels, and darker voxels tend to be surrounded by darker voxels. Since we can make a reasonably accurate guess about what the signal intensity will look like for a given voxel, given its neighbors, the voxels are not completely independent. Bonferroni correction, then, is too severe. Although it virtually guarantees to keep your false positive rate below 5%, it will also probably lead to a high false negative rate. That is, you'll probably conclude that no effect exists when there actually is one. An alternative is cluster correction, which is the most popular correction method in fMRI analysis. Cluster correction takes advantage of the fact that the voxels in a typical data set are not completely independent. Instead of testing each voxel individually, clusters of voxels are tested for significance. To illustrate this, let's take a coronal slice from the group level incongruent minus congruent contrast you created in the fMRI tutorial. Notice how the brighter colors can be grouped into distinct clusters. If we look at this from a different angle, we can think of the clusters of voxels as mountain ranges. The height of an individual voxel is determined by its z-value, and higher z-values lead to higher peaks. The threshold that we apply is a cross-section through the mountains at a certain height. For example, a z-value of 3.1 corresponding to a p-value of 0.001, and we only observe the peaks that remain after applying this threshold. This is known as thresholding the image, or more specifically, setting a cluster-defining threshold, since only those voxels that are at or above that threshold will remain. And this threshold is the value that you see in the Poststats tab of the Feet GUI. You may think that's all we need to do, and as far as entering numbers into the feet GUI, it is. But there's an additional hidden step happening after you press the Go button that you should know about. Remember that a cluster-defining threshold is not the same as an alpha level. It could be that the clusters as large as the ones in our group analysis are just as likely to be found in images created from pure noise. 
Let's say that our cluster in the medial prefrontal cortex is 50 voxels large. What we need to ask ourselves now is how often would we expect a cluster of that size to appear due to chance? To answer this, we run simulations. In other words, we create artificial data sets with the same dimensions and smoothness as our task data set, but which are composed of pure noise. We then write down the size of the largest cluster that passes our cluster defining threshold and repeat the process with another simulated data set. If we do this thousands and thousands of times, we can create a distribution of maximum cluster sizes. And from this distribution, we can calculate the percentage of the time we would observe a cluster as large as the one we generated from our task data set. If that percentage is lower than our alpha level of 5%, we can reject the null hypothesis for that cluster. And these are the clusters that are automatically generated by FSL and stored in the images with the thresh prefix. Afterwards, all that's left for you to do is publish that paper, go home, put some hot pockets in the microwave, and then watch your favorite Counter-Strike 1.6 demos. Because, as we all know, Global Offensive just isn't that good. Ladies, am I right? Oh my god, fucking A. Oh, oh, what? See, you need to make a movie with that, dude.